Hi and welcome to a guide to the first of the real OCR papers. So this was the paper that was sat on the 12th of June 2017. It's the biological processes paper. Now the goal of this read through is to show you how to approach the questions, give you some tips on how to answer them, explain a bit of the theory that you needed to apply. So hopefully you'll be able to improve your grades. Let's get on with the paper. The paper begins with 15 multiple choice questions. First one, which of the options A to D correctly describes how an endotherm would respond to an increase in temperature? So an endotherm obtains its heat from within, hence endo. How it would respond to an increase in temperature is by carrying out actions which would reduce that increase. Now options B, C and D the erector muscles contract, causing the hairs to stand up, would cause more insulation, hence less heat loss. Contr rapid contractions of skeletal muscles would cause an increase in the temperature. And the sweat glands releasing less sweat would cause the loss of less heat through less evaporative cooling, because you've got less sweat. So the option a, which is dilation of the arterioles near the surface of the skin, that would cause a greater blood flow through the surface of the skin, through the capillaries, which would lead to an increase in heat loss. So the correct option here is the answer A. So which of the images A to D correctly summarizes photosynthesis? There's an easy way to get to this answer, which is to look at where the wrong answers are. So A refers to reduced NAD, which doesn't get used in photosynthesis. So does B. In fact, C is the only one that correctly refers to reduced NADP. And that's reduced NADP being produced by the light dependent reaction and being consumed in the light independent reaction. <laughs> Additionally, you can see that the light dependent reaction produces oxygen, which it does by photolysis. It splits water to produce the electrons to reduce the NADP, which gets consumed in the light independent reaction, which takes in carbon dioxide and uses that to, to make um, glucose, amino acids, um, and all of the products of photosynthesis. So the correct answer here is C. So a student counted stomata on a leaf using a light microscope. The image below shows the stomata that were visible. They ask you to work out which of the options A to D is the correct stomatal density for this leaf. Remember that magnification equals image over object. Now the magnification is 60 times. You need to work out the size of the object. And what you need to work out is the height and the width in order to give you the area. So this is where you need to get out your ruler and you need to measure the height which is some 75 millimeters and the width which is about 100 millimeters. It'll vary depending on the size in which your image has been printed. Then you need to divide by the magnification. So you need to divide 75 by 60 which gives you 1.25 millimeters. And you need to divide 100 by 60. Which is going to give you 1.6. Now in order to work out the area, you need to multiply the two together. So you do 1.6 times 1.25, which gives you an area of 2 millimetres squared. Now the next thing to do is to count these tomato. Now I've counted these and I reckon there are 17 stomata here. So how many are there in one millimetre? 
it's 17 divided by 2 to give you the answer in millimetres squared. So the closest answer here would be A, that of 7.5 stomata per millimetre squared. Now they ask you which of the options A to D occurs in the nucleus of the cell. The crucial word there is in. So where does synthesis of enzymes occur? Well, enzymes are proteins, and proteins get synthesized at ribosomes, and ribosomes, well, they're made in the nucleolus of the cell, but the ribosomes are in the cytoplasm, so they're either bound to the um, endoplasmic reticulum, forming rough endoplasmic reticulum, or they're free in the cytoplasm. So synthesis of enzymes definitely doesn't occur in the nucleus. Synthesis of RNA, namely messenger RNA, um, is the process of transcription, and that definitely occurs in the nucleus of the cell. Modification of polypeptides occurs in the Golgi apparatus, and synthesis of carbohydrates doesn't occur in the nucleus of the cell. So the answer definitely here is B. So this question asks about the differences between mitosis and meiosis in the number of chromosomes before, during and after different types of cell division. So which of the options A to D correctly describes the stages of mitosis and meiosis in human cells? Well, meiosis is a reductive division where you start with a 2N cell, which then divides to give you N cells, which are haploid. Mitosis is about duplicating cells to produce genetically identical cells. So that's producing two 2N two cells from your original cell. Now, option one is the only option which takes you from a 2N to an N cell, so that must be meiosis. So, looking at the list, the only one which gives you the option for one being meiosis is answer D. If you want to look at point four, point four starts with a 2N cell and then gives you a 2N cell. Well, in fact, it would give you two 2N cells. So the answer here is D. So patients with kidney failure can be treated in different ways. Which of the following statements describes a feature of peritoneal dialysis? Now peritoneal dialysis is where you put dialyzing fluid into the, a gap in your abdomen and you use the peritoneum, which is the membrane covering the intestines, you use that as your dialyzing membrane. So in peritoneal dialysis, urea and mineral ions pass from your blood across the peritoneum into the fluid which you put into your abdomen. So that's definitely true of peritoneal dialysis. However, blood passing over an artificial membrane to remove toxins is hemodialysis. The hemo is blood and the patient receives immunosuppressant medication is how you would treat someone following the transplant of a kidney. So the only answer that's correct here is D. So bony fish absorb dissolved oxygen from the water using gills. Water is passed through the buccal cavity, that's the mouth, and over the gill lamellae. The gill lamellae are the site of the absorption of oxygen into the blood from the water, just like the alveoli are where you absorb oxygen from the air into your blood. The oxygen saturation of the blood and the water changes as the water passes over the gills because the blood is absorbing more oxygen from the water. So which of the statements A to D correctly describes the way oxygen is transferred into the blood at the gills? Now, this is one of the great 
mechanisms in biology which is known as countercurrent flow. And countercurrent flow has the water flowing in one direction and has the blood flowing in the opposite direction. Now this means that blood that's coming from the body of the fish has a low level of oxygen in it because the oxygen has been used in aerobic respiration. Now as it flows in the opposite direction to the flow of the water, then it's always encountering water with more oxygen in it than is in the blood. So that as you move along the gill, the oxygen always diffuses from the water into the blood because the blood's flowing in the opposite direction. So it's always encountering water with more oxygen in it. So the which of the statements A to D correctly describes the way oxygen is transferred? Option A gives you water and blood flow in a concurrent system. Well, that's definitely wrong. Water and blood flow in a countercurrent system, so that could be right. C, again concurrent, that's definitely wrong. And D, countercurrent. And then the other options is does it have a greater concentration gradient between them at the start of the gill lamellae, or does it have a constant concentration gradient? Now, the point of countercurrent flow is that it maintains a constant concentration gradient between the water and the blood so that oxygen is always diffusing out of the water into the blood because the water is always encountering blood with less oxygen in it. So the answer here is B. So this question asks you about the effect of temperature on the fixation of carbon dioxide and the fixation of oxygen by Rubisco. Rubisco is the enzyme that fixes carbon dioxide in the Calvin cycle, where it joins it with a five carbon compound um, to create a six carbon compound that splits immediately to give you two three carbons. So they give you a graph where you increase the temperature and then they look at the rate of reaction and the dotted line is carbon dioxide fixation and the solid line is oxygen fixation. Now it asks what are the correct percentage changes in Rubisco carbon dioxide and oxygen fixing activities between 30 and 40 degrees. So the only points you need to look at here are between 30 and 40 for the two graphs. Now the question really isn't about uh, Rubisco and isn't about temperature. It's can you read a graph and can you analyze the graph and then can you uh, reach a conclusion about the percentage changes? Now, there's two ways of doing this. Either you could read off the um, activity from the rate of reaction or you could have a guess. So first of all, looking at the carbon dioxide fixation, we can see that, well, there's not much. In fact, there's a slight decrease. So the slight decrease in CO2 fixation, and it looks like it might be about one or 2% going down. And if you look at the oxygen fixation, well, we've got about this much difference, and it's about 1.2, 1.3, and that's compared to this difference. The starting value here which is about 2.6 so you're thinking well it's about 1.3 over 2.6 so it's just over um, it's about 50 percent or maybe just over 50 percent depending on how you read it off from the graph so looking at the choices that they give you a b c or d first one that's going to leap out at you is c because that's got a slight decrease in carbon dioxide um, fixation about minus 2.4 percent that looks about right and then it's got an increase of 54 percent in oxygen fixation which again looks about right so we're going to go for C and that means we can then move on to the next question So question nine, the hormone HCG can be detected in urine 
use in pregnancy tests. So which of the following properties of the hormone HCG allows it to be detected in urine? Now HCG is human chorionic gonadotrophin and that's produced by the very early blastocyst where it implants into the lining of the uterus and it produces HCG which passes into the bloodstream of the mother, goes round in the bloodstream and causes the ovary to carry on producing progesterone which maintains the endometrium lining. Now what allows it to be detected in urine? Well remember that urine is produced by ultrafiltration. So the property that allows the hormone HCG to be detected in the urine is the fact that it's got a relative molecular mass of less than 69,000 because that means that it passes across from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. It becomes part of the filtrate which goes through the you know, loop of Henle and descending up, ascending and descending limb and collecting duct and then into the bladder and then is urinated out by the mother which enables it to be detected. So the answer here is B. So the hormone ecdysone is synthesized in the prothoracic glands. So it's synthesized in glands found in the upper thorax of some invertebrates and then released into the hemolymph. It's then transported to cells near the surface of the body and causes the loss of the exoskeleton so that a new exoskeleton can form. Now this is a hormone you never heard of the question is not about the hormone, it's about the nature of hormones. So which of the following statements explains how ecdysone is able to act on cells near the surface of the body when it's produced in the prothoracic glands, which are found in the upper thorax? Well, the fact that it's synthesized by some specialized neurosecretory cells is interesting, but it doesn't explain how it's able to act on cells near the surface of the body. What does is that it's soluble in the hemolymph because it's a polar molecule, therefore it's soluble and can be transported around in the hemolymph, and it's then complementary to cell surface receptors on cells throughout the body, therefore causing them to lose the exoskeleton. So the correct answer here is C, that only two or th statements two and three explain how it's able to act on cells near the surface of the body. So question 11 asks, which of the statements A to D correctly describes the process of adhesion? Now remember, water travels up the xylem through the cohesion tension theory of, which is driven by the evaporation of water from the spongy mesophyll. And as one water molecule evaporates, it drags up other water molecules because remember, water is a polar molecule. This means it has a polarity, it has an uneven distribution of charge where the hydrogens are slightly more positive than the oxygens, therefore they form hydrogen bonds with each other. Now these hydrogen bonds that they form between the slightly negative oxygens and the slightly negative hydrogens mean that they have a cohesion, they stick to each other. Adhesion is sticking to something else and what it sticks to is the walls of the xylem tissue. So the answer here is A. You can dismiss B because B is cohesion. C and D refer to the phloem tissue, which is not where water is transported in plants. So the correct answer here is A. So this question is about uh, nitrogenous excretory waste products. Now you'll be familiar with um, the kidney and urea and the conversion of ammonia into urea in the ornithine cycle that occurs in the liver. So they show you the structure of the nucleotide base guanine. So this is a 
purine base and it's got lots of nitrogen in it. You can see the nitrogens that are here. So bird droppings are known as guano because they contain a high proportion of guanine. Unlike mammals, birds excrete nitrogenous waste as guanine instead of urea. Guanine is synthesized from ammonia in the liver, a similar way to the synthesis of urea that you're familiar with. So the following statements relate to guanine. Ammonia is more toxic than guanine. So it would make sense to convert the ammonia into guanine because it would be less toxic. Urea is more soluble in water than guanine. Therefore, the guanine can be secreted as a partly soluble paste. If you're familiar with bird droppings, you, you'll realize this. And guanine has a high proportion of nitrogen. So which of the statements correctly explains why birds excrete guanine? Well, they'd want to excrete guanine because the ammonia would be more toxic, the urea would require more water, the guanine has a high proportion of nitrogen. So the answer here would be A. So as organisms get larger, they have less surface area in comparison to their volume. This is why large organisms need exchange surfaces and small organisms don't. They can just exchange their substances, exchange the oxygen and carbon dioxide over their surface rather than having specialized exchange surfaces such as lungs. We can illustrate this if you look at the surface area to volume ratio of a cube. So if we t take a cube of side length one, well, that's got a volume of one. One times one times one is one. It's got a surface area of one times one times six, because there are six sides to a cube. So we've got a surface area of six and a volume of one. So we've got a surface area to volume ratio of six to one. If we make that cube six times larger, we've got a side length of six. So this means that we have a volume of six times six times six, which is 216. And we've got a volume of six times six times six, which is again 216. So we have a surface area to volume ratio of one to one. Now, looking at this table they show you different sized mammals with different surface area to volume ratios and shows you the surface area and volumes of four different groups of mammal. Now the largest mammal is going to have the smallest surface area to volume ratio so we can instantly rule out A and D because we can see that Equus is going to have the the smallest surface area to volume ratio. In fact, if we do the sums on this, if we divide 18.26 by 2.24, we see that the answer is 8.18. Now, if we calculate all of the others, we can see that for Ocratologus, we've got 0 0.48 divided by 0 0.02, which will give us a value of 24, 24 to one. If we do it for mus, we can work out a value of 26.3. That's done by dividing the surface area by the volume. If we do it for ratus, we can see that we get 0 0.32 and we divide it by 0 0.016 and this gives us a surface area to volume ratio of 20. So we can see that the largest surface area to volume ratio is mus, then it's ratus, sorry, then it's Ocratologus, then it's Rattus, then it's Equus. So the answer here is C.
The commercially grown tobacco plant has many pests. One such insect pest is Manduca sexta, which causes damage to the stems and leaves of Nicotinia rustica, which is the tobacco plant. They then tell you about a tiny wasp, and this wasp lays its eggs inside the body of the thing that eats the tobacco plant. Now, those eggs hatch and become larvae, which munch their way through the body of the host that they've been laid in, which is the body of the Manduca sexta. Now, this is good for the tobacco plant because it's going to reduce the number of larvae that are eating it. So, Nicotinia rustica produces a volatile organic compound called volicitin when its leaves are damaged. So the leaves are being damaged by the insect pest Manduca sexta, so it then produces this volatile compound which attracts the parasitic wasps. So this is a cunning plan by the tobacco plant. Produce this substance as a result of being eaten, attract a parasitic wasp which is then going to lay its eggs and cause the larvae to eat the thing that's eating them. So which of the following explains why Nicotinia rustica releases volicitin? So volicitin release reduces herbivory. Herbivory is being eaten, if you're a plant, in Nicotinia rustica. Now, this is a good idea. So it's definitely true that one would explain why they release it, because it reduces herbivory by increasing the numbers of the parasitic wasps, which lay their eggs inside the... Um, inside the things which are eating the tobacco plant. Point two, volicitin release increases Manduca sexta growth rate. Now, this doesn't explain why they'd release it. So why would you release a substance which would increase the growth rate of the thing that's eating you? So we're not keen on point two. And Volicitin release reduces parasitism of Manduca sexta by uh, Cotesia congregata. Well, that's not the case because they've told you that it attracts Cotesia congregata at high concentrations. So of these statements, we're not keen on two or three. So this rules out A, B and C, which leaves us with the only correct answer that is D. Mistletoe is a plant parasite that lives on the stems of other plants. It survives by removing water and assimilates from the host plant. Now, assimilates are the products of photosynthesis. The mistletoe binds to the stem of the host plant and grows a specialised root-like tissue called a haustorium that attaches to different tissues in the stem. Now, one species of mistletoe contains no chloroplasts. What do chloroplasts do? Chloroplasts carry out photosynthesis, produce triosphosphate that is then used to make you know, amino acids and glucose and fats and everything that the plant needs that has carbon in it. Now, how does the mistletoe survive? Which of the options A to D explains why viscum minimum does not need chloroplasts? The, the options they give you are that the hausterium of viscum minimum attaches to sieve tube elements. Now the sieve tube elements carry the phloem. The phloem has the products of photosynthesis in it. That would make sense so that the haustarium is causing, is allowing the mistletoe to take the products of photosynthesis, the phloem, from the sieve tube elements. Therefore it doesn't need chloroplast because it's taking the sugars and amino acids from the um, plant that it's parasitizing. Other options they give you are that it attaches to the xylem vessels. Well, that wouldn't explain why it doesn't need chloroplasts. It attaches to the meristem or the cambium. Again, these tissues are not carrying the sugars. So the hausterium attaches to the sieve tube elements. The sieve tube elements are carrying the sugars in the host plant and therefore the answer here is A. 
Now this question, you really don't need to know anything about mistletoe, you don't need to know anything about parasitism. What they're asking for is where are the sugars carried? Because if it doesn't need chloroplasts, it needs to get the sugars. How does it get those sugars? It attaches the, the haustarium to the sieve tube elements and you know that the sieve tube elements carry the phloem. So the answer here is A. On to section B, question 16. Many insects such as moths and bees are insulated with scales and hair and are known as facultative endotherms. Now facultative means optional or discretionary and endotherm means that the heat is generated from inside them. So their metabolism during flight can cause the temperature of the flight muscles to increase 20 to 30 degrees above the external temperature. And this is a result of their metabolism, their respiration, their contraction of, the, um, of their flight muscles. So using the information provided, explain why many moths and bumblebees are described as endothermic. Now, because it says using the information provided, the information must be in the question. So the parts that you're looking for here are the insulation and the metabolism. The metabolism is going to generate the heat and the insulation is going to hold in that heat, causing the moth and the bumblebee to be an endotherm because it's going to retain the heat generated by metabolism. So the answers they were looking for were scales and hair help reduce the heat loss and then they generate the heat from metabolism or respiration. Now on to part two. So it's more difficult for moths and bumblebees to maintain their body temperature than for mammals and birds to maintain their body temperature. Explain why. Now the crucial word that you need to look at here is more difficult. So it needs to be a comparative statement in your answer. So you need to be thinking what is different between moths and bumblebees and mammals and birds. Well, the first thing that's different is that they are very different in size. So if you have a mammal or a bird, it's considerably larger than a moth or a bumblebee. Hence, the moth and the bumblebee is going to have a much larger surface area to volume ratio because it's much smaller and small things have a larger surface area to volume ratio because they're small. Additionally, thinking about a mammal and a bird as compared to moths and bumblebees is that they have feathers and feathers are really effective insulators. So feathers and fur are much better at insulating than the few hairs that you have around the outside of a moth or a bumblebee. So what they were looking for was that insects are smaller, therefore they have a larger surface area to volume ratio. So again, insects were smaller than the mammals and the birds. And then they have a greater rate of heat loss as a result of that larger surface area to volume ratio and also as a result of the more effective insulation um, that is present in mammals and birds. When walking, the abdomen of caterpillars expands and contracts slowly. So this alters the volume in the abdomen, therefore it alters the pressure Therefore, it means that air will move in and ventilate the exchange surfaces. The exchange surface in a caterpillar, because it's an insect, the exchange surface is going to be the tracheole. Um, so the end of the tracheole, where it goes into each of the um, cells of the caterpillar. Um, that surface needs ventilation, which is the movement of the respiratory medium, which is the air over the respiratory surface. So. One of these holes is labelled in 16, um, figure 16, so they very helpfully show you the hole, and here it is. So name these holes. So you've just got to say what they're called, and the answer is that they're called a spiracle. 
Now, fluid is found in the tubes responsible for gaseous exchange in insects. So this fluid is in the end of the tracheole and the tracheole goes into a cell and there is fluid in the end of it. And this fluid is just water. And when the insect is um, doing lots of exercise, then that fluid gets taken up into the cell and that increases the surface area of the end of the tracheole because if you have less fluid there well um, you're going to have more surface area for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide and also that fluid will contain dissolved oxygen and when the insect stops flying then it's going to fill up again with fluid so name this fluid that's in the end of the tracheole. It is tracheal fluid. Then outline the reasons why insects and other animals need well-developed transport systems. So important bit here, well-developed and insects and other animals. Now, you've got to take care when answering this question what they're looking for here is that you have a high demand for metabolism because they're expending a lot of energy. Therefore, they need a lot of oxygen. Just move this up a bit. Now, diffusion will be too slow because there, it, there are too many layers of cells to diffuse through from the surface to where the oxygen is being consumed. You need to maintain a steep concentration gradient so that you get in lots of oxygen and you get out the carbon dioxide. Surface area to volume ratio is normally low because insects and animals are normally quite large. Now, this is a very good exam technique point. Students are very keen on writing things like nutrients are needed by the cells. If you'd written glucose, amino acids, you'll get the mark. If you write nutrients, you probably won't because you're not being specific. They're looking for named metabolites here. Sorry, there up my highlighter here we go named metabolites and they're looking for named waste products so if you said the cells need to have the waste removed you wouldn't get the mark but if you'd written say carbon dioxide or urea needed to be removed then you would get the mark so a student planned to carry out a dissection of insects and fish gaseous exchange systems the student planned to complete diagrams of the different tissues. They were advised to observe the following guidelines. Use a sharp pencil, use ruled label lines, and include a scale bar. Now, you, the question then asks you to suggest two further guidelines for the student to follow to ensure they present their diagrams clearly and accurately. Now, this is a quite a common um, suggest question. You need to place yourselves in the feet of the person suggesting it to the student. So if you were saying to a friend, how would you carry out this drawing to make sure it would be clear and accurate? What advice would you give to that friend? This also shows the importance of carrying out and revising your practical skills. The practical skills are assessed in the exam, so you do need to revise and take care with them. You need to think about um, what those practical skills are teaching you. So these are some of the guidelines that the examiner would expect you to come up with. So they would expect you to use at least 50% of the page, that you'd have a title, that the labels would not be on the actual drawing of say the gill or the tracheole that the labels would be away from that to the side that the lines shouldn't cross over each other 
that you should use a clear single continuous line that you should not use no shading or hatching or dotting or color you should use plain paper you should state the magnifications and that the tissue should have the correct proportions So cirrhosis of the liver can result from long-term liver damage. Alcohol or other toxins can cause this damage. Scientists have suggested that cirrhosis can be detected by taking samples of bodily fluids and testing of the two different molecules, which are the C-reactive protein and the copeptin. The liver produces these two molecules and increased levels can indicate liver damage due to cirrhosis. Different bodily fluids from a patient su suspected of having cirrhosis were tested for C-reactive protein and copeptin. So they show you a graph and you can see that they took the bodily fluids from the blood, saliva, urine and feces and they tested them for t the two different um, compounds. So they tested them for copeptin, which is shown in the filled in boxes, and then the C-reactive protein, which is the not filled in. They express this as a bar chart, and on the left-hand axis, they have the concentration of the molecules, and it's going up in orders of magnitude. So 1 times 10 to the 1 is 10. 1 times 10 to the 2 is 100, 1 times 10 to the 3 is 1,000, 1 times 10 to the 4 is 10,000, and so on. 1 times 10 to the 6 is a million, and 1 times 10 to the 9 is a billion. So what's the difference in the order of magnitude of the concentration of the copeptin in the feces compared to the concentration of C-reactive protein in the saliva? Well, concentration of copeptin in the feces is 1 times 10 to the 9, so that's a billion. And in the saliva, the concentration of C-reactive protein is 10, so 1 times 10 to the 10. So 1 times 10 to the 1. So if you take a billion and subtract 10 times, then you have... 1 times 10 to the 8. So the answer that they were looking for here was the difference in order of magnitude is some 1 times 10 to the 8. So suggest why blood and feces have the highest concentration of C-reactive protein and copeptin. Now, you've never heard of C-reactive protein and copeptin. This is a suggest question. Now, you know where it's made. It's made in the liver. Well, why would it be in the blood? And why would it be in the feces? Well, it would be in the blood because the liver has a very good blood supply. Why would it be in the feces? That's a more difficult one. And you've got to think, well, what moves from the liver to the feces and that's the bile because the bile remember is made from um, red blood cells or remnants of red blood cells and passes down from the liver to the down the bile duct to the gallbladder and then into your small intestine where it emulsifies fats so this one is about thinking laterally and thinking that they're looking for you to say that the liver has a good blood supply and that it's um, the copeptin and C-reactive protein are secreted into the bile, which then goes down the bile duct and then becomes part of your feces. So figure 17.2 is an image of a Kupfer cell from the liver. The diameter of the Kupfer cell in the image is 9.1 centimeters. So this is the size of the image the actual picture is 9.1 centimeters. Assuming it's spherical, calculate the actual volume of this cell and then give the answer to four significant figures and show you're working. Most important thing about this picture is that they have given you a scale bar at the bottom. 
Now the scale bar enables you to calculate the magnification. Remember that magnification is the number of times larger that the image is than the object. So the image is the picture of the thing and the object is the actual thing. Now on this um, picture, the thing that you know the actual size of is the scale bar. So whenever you get a scale bar, the first thing you do is you get a ruler and you put it on the scale bar and you measure the size of the scale bar. This is enormously important. You must do this every time. So you put a ruler on the scale bar, you measure the length and you can see that it is some 20 millimeters. Now, 20 millimeters is the size of the image because you're measuring the picture of the scale bar. The scale bar is the size of the object, which is four micrometers. Now, top tip here is always to put things into the units that are the smallest that are given to you by the exam board. So the smallest unit here is the micrometer. So we need to convert everything into micrometers and just use micrometers. So 20 millimeters is some 20,000 micrometers because there are a thousand micrometers in a millimeter. Always use SI units, never use things which aren't SI units. And we divide by four micrometers. And this gives us a magnification of 5,000. So we've now worked out the magnification of the drawing by measuring the scale bar and dividing by the size of the scale bar. Now we've got to take an image size, which is 9.1 centimeters. And we know the magnification, which is 5,000. And we need to work out the object size to work out the actual diameter of the cup for cell. So we need to rearrange this equation. So we need to take 9.1 centimeters and divide by 5,000. Now, remember, my advice was always use the smallest units that are shown to you by on the question. So we need to convert 9.1 centimeters into an SI unit, which is 91 millimeters. And then we need to put that into micrometers. So we have 91,000. And then we take that 91,000 micrometers and divide by the magnification, which is 5,000. And this gives us an answer of 18.2 micrometers. So we've now calculated the actual diameter. We know that the actual diameter is the image size divided by 5,000, which gave us an actual diameter of 18.2 micrometers. So having calculated that, the next step is to turn that actual diameter into a volume. So we need to then think what is our equation for the volume of a sphere, and that is four over three pi times r cubed. So we've now got the diameter, which was 18.2. So we need to divide by two to give us our radius. And the radius is 9.1 micrometers. So we then need to take um, the radius and then put it into that equation and multiply to give us 4 thirds pi r cubed. And this gives us an answer of So 3,156.55, and the units are 
micrometers cubed, because remember we've calculated a volume here. Now crucially they ask us to give this in four significant figures, so we have to express the answer to four significant figures, not the six that it's currently shown in. So what they were looking for you to write was any of these possible answers. So all of these possible answers are correct, but they do have to be expressed to four significant figures. Hope that helped. So a two mark question, which type of microscope has been used to obtain this image and then explain your answer? Well, you should realize that you've got a magnification of 5,000 times, yet you've got a great deal of clarity, which shows you have a high resolution. You've got a black and white image that is two dimensional. So this is clear that you're dealing with a transmission electron microscope. And then to explain why you think that, you could justify it with any of these statements. It's a two dimensional image. You can't see any um, depth or uh, you can't see a three dimensional image. You can see individual organelles. It's got a very high magnification. It's got a very high resolution. All of these are justifications as to why it's a transmission electron micro microscope picture. So light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration and temperature are all limiting factors in photosynthesis. Explain what is meant by a limiting factor. Now, as it says explain, it is possible to get the marks here from getting, giving a suitable described example of how light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration and temperature are limiting factors in photosynthesis. What they were looking for was that a limiting factor is a factor that determines the rate or limits the rate. Um, here we go. Factor that determines or limits the rate. They're crucially looking for rate. When it, it is at a lower or a suboptimal level. Suitable example would be that when carbon dioxide concentration is in a short supply, i.e. at its a suboptimal level or lower than it should be, it prevents the rate of photosynthesis from increasing. Hence, carbon dioxide concentration is the limiting factor. An investigation was carried out into the effect of adding different volumes of water on the survival of seedlings. When you get a experimental investigation like this and you get the data, you should spend a moment thinking, well, what's the independent variable and what's the dependent variable? So the independent variable would be the different volumes of water. And the dependent variable is the survival of seedlings. Now, the independent variable has been varied from 10 centimeters cubed volume of water added to the soil up to 60. And the dependent variable is the number of seedlings surviving worth spending some time looking at the data before you look at the questions that they ask you about that data. So what can you see? You can see that when you add 10 centimeter cubed volume of water, the number of seedlings, well, they almost all survive. After 18 days, you have 57 seedlings surviving. However, when you add 30 centimeter cubed of water, you can see that after 18 days, there are only 48. When you add 40 centimeter cubes of water, you can see that after 18 days, there are only 20. And that after, when you add 60 centimeter cubed volume of water to the soil, you can see that after 18 days, only two survive. In fact, you can see that at nine days, there are only 21 surviving. So you can see that as you increase the volume of water, when you get past about 30 centimeter cubed of water, it causes a dramatic drop in the number of seedlings that survive after 12 to 18 days. So summarize the conclusions that can be drawn from these data. Now, what you can conclude is that as you increase the volume of water, the 
fewer seedlings survive. Additionally, you can conclude that there's a dramatic decrease in the survival rate of the seedlings above 30 centimeters cubed. And that when you add the water, it has no effect on the number of seedlings survive up to the first three days. Now, when it says summarizing the conclusions that can be drawn from these data, there's always going to be a mark for quoting relevant data points to support your conclusions. So as long as you use those data points to support any point, you get that additional mark. On to the six mark question. Water can fill air spaces in the soil surrounding the roots. This prevents oxygen from reaching the root hair cells. Now using your knowledge of both aerobic and anaerobic respiration, explain why overall watering can kill the plants. So you need to be thinking about if you stop aerobic respiration because there is no oxygen, how would that affect the root hair cells? What do the root hair cells do? And how could that absence of aerobic respiration in the root hair cells, how could that kill the plant? You've also got to use your knowledge of anaerobic respiration. Remember, anaerobic respiration in plants is produces um, ethanol and carbon dioxide and ethanol is toxic. So that's again worth um, mentioning. Now, the points that they're looking for with aerobic respiration are that because you've prevented the oxygen from entering the root hair cells, because there's no oxygen, there's no aerobic respiration. Well, what's that going to stop? That's going to stop oxidative phosphorylation. What does the oxygen do? It acts as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria um, that are in the root hair cells. Therefore, you can't produce the ATP. So therefore, the plant has to switch to anaerobic respiration. Remember, with no oxygen, you can only have glycolysis and therefore you would have um, anaerobic respiration producing ethanol or alcohol in order to regenerate the NAD that, so that glycolysis can continue. Because remember that the pyruvate is being turned into ethanol, which then gets reduced into ethanol by accepting the hydrogens and electrons from the reduced NAD to regenerate the NAD. And that only produces two ATPs, which is far fewer than would be produced using um, aerobic respiration. Now, what consequences is that going to have for the plant? Well, the consequences will be that ethanol is toxic. The production of alcohol is irreversible. You produce far fewer ATPs from glycolysis than you do through um, oxidative phosphorylation, for which you need the oxygen. Therefore, there will be less active transport. So you're linking the absence of aerobic respiration to what the root hair cell does. And the root hair cell takes up mineral ions by active transport. Those mineral ions that it takes up, it would use to make amino acids, DNA, RNA, chlorophyll, anything with nitrogen in it, anything with phosphate in it. Additionally, because you're not actively transporting the um, mineral ions from the soil into the root hair, then you can't reduce the water potential in the root hair cells. Therefore, water wouldn't move by osmosis because you're lowering the solute potential in the root hair cells by actively moving in the ions. You don't have the ATP to do that. Therefore, you can't actively move in the ions. Therefore, the water doesn't move by osmosis from the root hair cell, from the soil into the root hair cell. Therefore, you'd have less photosynthesis because um, water is a raw material for photosynthesis because remember it splits in photolysis in uh, the light dependent reactions to produce the electrons that you then use to reduce the carbon dioxide. Now, all of these points you need to discuss 
to get the five to six marks. Well, certainly a large chunk of these points you need to discuss. So what they were looking for you to do was just move this across a bit more. Make a detailed scientific statement about aerobic respiration and a detailed scientific statement about anaerobic respiration and a consequence to the plant as a result of overwatering. So you're trying to say, well, why does the plant do aerobic respiration in the root hair cells? What's the consequence of that aerobic respiration not occurring because you've overwatered it, therefore denied the oxygen to the root hair cells? What will it do when there's no oxygen, which is anaerobic respiration, which produces far fewer ATPs? And what's the consequence for the plant in that as a result of having fewer ATPs, it's unable to move the mineral ions, therefore it can't make the amino acids or the um, DNA or the chlorophyll, therefore it can't get the water to come in because it's not not lowering the solute potential in the root hair cells, therefore the seedling dies. Soluble mineral ions are present in soil. So soluble means they dissolve in water. Explain why water molecules can form hydrogen bonds with nitrate ions. Now nitrate ions are negatively charged. Water is a polar molecule. That means it has an uneven distribution of charge so that the hydrogen is slightly positive, the oxygen is slightly negative. Therefore it forms hydrogen bonds with the nitrate ions. So what they're looking for you to say was that water is a polar molecule, that the nitrate ion is charged, and that the hydrogen bonds form between the hydrogen on the water, which is slightly positive charged, and the oxygen on the nitrate, which is slightly negatively charged. On to part two. So figure 18 shows a process that occurs in the cell surface membrane of the endodermis in the root. And what you can see is you can see ATP being hydrolyzed into ADP and P. So you know that this is releasing energy. And the energy is being used to move these mysterious hexagons from where there are few hexagons here to where there are lots of hexagons here. And that's into the endodermal cell across this thing here, which is the phospholipid bilayer. And the hexagons are moving through a protein carrier. Now the hexagons are moving from where there are few to where there are lots. So they're moving against their concentration gradient, which is why they require the use of energy, the hydrolysis of the ATP. Now it says explain how the events shown cause water to enter the endodermis. So you've moved solutes across the phospholipid bilayer from where there are few to where there are more. So you're causing there to be more solutes inside the endodermal cells. The presence of the more solutes will lower the water potential of the cell. So you will get water moving by osmosis into the endodermal cell. And these are the points that they wish you to make. So firstly, that the solutes or the ions enter against the concentration gradient, therefore that must require energy, therefore it's active transport. That reduces the water potential of the endodermal cell because you've got more dissolved solutes, therefore it lowers the solute potential and lowers the water potential. And therefore water will move by osmosis down the water potential gradient into the endodermal cell. So a four mark question on explain why a plant leaf is described as an organ. Now this is one of those sorts of questions where it's easy to get two marks, but it's actually quite hard to get four and you have to be very specific to get four. So it's saying you have a plant leaf. Well, the plant leaf is an organ. So you need to talk about the definition of an organ. Then you have to show how a plant leaf would fit that definition of an organ. So you should know that an organ is a collection of tissues and those tissues perform a particular function. Well, how does the plant leaf fulfill 
that definition of organ. It fulfills that definition because it's got different tissues which you should name. So spongy mesophyll, palisade, vascular, phloem, etc. And then what do they do? They carry out photosynthesis. So therefore you've explained why it is and what structures are present in a plant leaf that enable you to describe it as an organ. So sperm cells in animals are formed by a process known as spermatogenesis. Figure 19.1 is a summary of the process of spermatogenesis. So we've got the original cell which has four chromosomes in it. Now in process A we've doubled the quantity of DNA but the quantity of chromosomes remains the same. We've done this through semi-conservative replication which occurs in interphase. Now, the original cell is a 2n diploid cell. It's got four chromosomes, so n equals 2, and it's diploid. This cell is in prophase 1. It's formed by valence, which are pairs of homologous chromosomes. And then this cell is at the end of the first division of meiosis. So it's gone through prophase, metaphase, where the bivalents line up on the equator, anaphase, where the bivalents get pulled apart, and telophase, where the cells split. So this is prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase one, where we've taken a pair of homologous chromosomes, in fact, two pairs, because 2n equals two. So 2n equals four, n equals two in this case. And we've pulled them apart to give us our two separate cells, each of which are have two chromosomes and they are haploid. So these are now N cells, they contain two chromosomes. Now each of those cells then goes through the mitotic part of meiosis. And this is where you take the chromosome there's two chromosomes and you pull them apart and they split at the centromere and then you end up with two chromosomes in each of the cells. So part C is meiosis 2 which consists of metaphase 2, anaphase 2 and telophase 2. Part D is the process of spermiogenesis, which is the maturation of the cells, putting on the midpiece, making of the flagellum, making of the acrosome, and so on. Three phases of meiosis are listed below. Match each phase of meiosis to a letter on figure 19.1. So metaphase one occurs during the stage labeled B because you've got metaphase, anaphase, telophase one, and that takes a homologous, a pair of homologous chromosomes and then separates those homologous chromosomes. So you end up with one of each of the homologous chromosomes in each of the two daughter haploid cells. So metaphase one occurs during the stage labeled B. So telophase two is taking the chromosome, pulling apart the chromatids, splitting the centromere, and telophase two occurs during the stage labeled C. And anaphase one occurs when the um, homologous chromosomes, the bivalents, are pulled apart in meiosis one. So that occurs during stage labeled B. Now a fairly simple fill in the missing words question. The chromosomes carried by sperm are made of DNA. Following passage about nucleic acids has four words missing. Then you've got to pick the missing words from the list and only this list and complete the passage by writing them in the gaps. So nucleic acids are made from, what do you reckon? Nucleotide monomers. Phosphodiester bonds form between the monomers. They consist of A phosphate group between the 
pentose molecules. So this is between the deoxyribose sugar and the phosphate group forming the backbone of the molecule. In DNA, hydrogen bonding between the two anti-parallel strands causes the characteristic double helix shape. So figure 19.2 is a transverse section of the sperm cell. The mitochondria of the sperm cell form a spiral around the central flagellum. So this is just a picture of a mitochondria where they're asking you to identify the structures. But they're giving you the mitochondria in a unusual way. You're used to seeing mitochondria with an outer membrane, a gap between the two membranes, which is known as the intermembrane space. You've got an inner mitochondrial membrane, which surrounds the matrix. You may also be familiar that you've got a single circular loop of DNA. You might have some ribosomes and you might even have some stalked particles, which is the ATP synthase part of oxidative phosphorylation. But they're giving you it in an unfamiliar context, which is a challenge to some students. So identify the structures labeled with the following letters. So what U? Well, U is the mitochondrial matrix. What W? Well, W is the Christi or the inner mitochondrial membrane. The Christi is part of the inner mitochondrial membrane. It's the infoldings. And then what might be Z? Z is the intermembrane space, which is the gap between the inner and the outer membranes where you build up the proton gradient um, from the flow of electrons along the electron transport chain. And then those protons flow out through ATP synthase going into the matrix and that generates the ATP. So after a couple of relatively simple questions, they ask you something that's really quite difficult. So ATP FADH2, also known as reduced FAD, and hexose 1,6-biphosphate are three organic products of respiration in sperm cells. Table 19 shows how the production of ATP reduced FAD and hexose 1,6-biphosphate is affected by three different substances. Now, first thing to think about is where ATP is produced. So ATP is produced in glycolysis by substrate double phosphorylation. It's also produced by substrate double phosphorylation in the Krebs cycle. And then it's produced by oxidative phosphorylation where you take the reduced coenzymes um, produced by glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the link reaction. And they drive the electron transport chain, push the hydrogen ions across the um, in a membrane from the matrix into the intermembrane space, and then the hydrogen ions flow out through ATP synthase, generating ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. Now, they give you three different substances. So they give you sucrose, which is a disaccharide, and sucrose is going to be hydrolyzed to give you glucose and fructose, and then the glucose is going to be phosphorylated twice, and that's by using a phosphate from an ADP being turned into an ATP. Now that occurs in the cytoplasm and then that causes the production of hexose, six O's, hex is six, and biphosphate or bisphosphate, which is a glucose with two phosphates added onto it. And those two phosphates come from the ATP being hydrolyzed to give you two ADPs. Now, what happens to those hexose biphosphates is that they then split to give you two triose phosphates. And those two triose phosphates then produce two ATPs each through substrate level phosphorylation, which is how you produce your net gain of four minus two. So that's four ATPs produced from glycolysis minus the two that are consumed. And that produces the pyruvate, which then passes into the matrix of the mitochondrion and then goes through the link reaction and Krebs cycle. So with sucrose, we make ATP. We also make reduced FAD because that's made in the Krebs cycle. And then we make we also make hexose 1,6 biphosphate because that's 
part of glycolysis. Now when we add cyanide, you can see that with cyanide, you still produce ATP, you produce two and a half, um, what's that, 10 to the minus 10 moles per second. So that that's a lot less than you do with the sucrose because you've got no oxidative phosphorylation. And you can tell that's been produced from glycolysis because you're producing hexose 1,6 biphosphate. Now, that doesn't happen with fluoride. So with fluoride, we get the production of no ATPs, we got no reduced FADs, and we have no hexose 1,6 biphosphates. So what conclusion can we make about the differences between cyanide and fluoride? Well, we can say that with fluoride, it stops glycolysis, link reaction, and Krebs cycle because there's no hexose 1,6 biphosphate. So it must be stopping the process that phosphorylates the glucose to form hexose 1,6 biphosphate. Additionally, there's no FAD produced. Whereas with when we add cyanide, we can see that there's no FADH2 produced, so there must be no Krebs cycle. And there is hexose 1,6 biphosphate produced, therefore the ATPs produced when you have cyanide must have come from glycolysis. So what can be concluded about the difference between the effects of just cyanide and fluoride on respiration in sperm? This is only a one mark question, but because it's a difference, it needs to be a comparative statement. So you need to say cyanide this, whereas fluoride that. And what they're looking for is that cyanide is going to stop aerobic respiration, whereas fluoride is going to prevent anaerobic respiration because you've got no production of the hexose 1,6 biphosphate, which is a crucial part of anaerobic respiration because anaerobic respiration is just glycolysis with a different way of regenerating the NADs. A student carried out an investigation into the production of carbon dioxide in five different species of yeast. And here are the five different species. The yeast cells were placed in different environments and carbon dioxide production was measured. So the dependent variable is the number of carbon dioxide bubbles produced per, per minute and they used aerobic and anaerobic conditions. They calculated standard deviations to show the variance around the mean and they calculated standard deviations in all of the aerobic conditions and then four of the anaerobic conditions and they ask you to calculate the standard deviation that's missing. So using the information in the table, calculate the standard deviation for the number of carbon dioxide bubbles produced by um, A. Pullalans no idea how you pronounce that, in anaerobic conditions. Now this question caused a considerable degree of panic in the exam because OCR forgot to give you the standard deviation equation. Um, caused a lot of stress and a lot of chat on Twitter afterwards. Um, they have amended the papers now so that the paper you should have should have the standard deviation equation. You don't have to know it, they do have to give it to you. It's not one of the equations that you need to know. You need to know things like volume of a sphere, surface area of a circle and of a sphere, but you don't need to know the standard deviation equation um, off by heart. You do need to know how to calculate it. So looking at that equation, we need to see that standard deviation is the square root of the sum of a value minus the mean squared divided by n minus one and then the whole thing square rooted. So the first step we need to do is to calculate the mean and the mean is 30. Now you can actually see this from the graph that they've given you in the second part of the question because here they have a mean and you can see that it's 30. So if you're particularly cunning, you didn't actually have to work out the mean. Um, if you miss that point, then you just have to add up the values 
picture here. And when you add them up, they come to 360. And then you need to divide by the um, number of those values, which is 12. And that's going to give you a mean, which is x bar, which is going to be 30. So what do you do next? Well, next you have to subtract 30 from all of the values. So you need to do 34 minus 30, 36 minus 30, 29 minus 30. And I'll work these out and put these next to them. Then you're going to have to square the difference between the value and the mean. So you're going to have to take 4 and square it. So that's going to be x minus x bar squared. So that's going to give you 16. So having done x minus x bar squared, we then need to do the next part, which is to add together x minus x bar squared. Up here, we can see the symbol. This symbol like this means add these values together. So we add them all together and we get 232. So now we have to divide by n minus 1. So we've got n is 12. So n minus 1 is 11. And that's going to give us 21.09. We then need to square root that value. Which will give us a value of 4.59. Now, being careful with this, it says, or being careful with the final answer, it says give your answer to one significant figure. So we've got to round this to the nearest a number in order to give it to one significant figure and the nearest is five. So the answer is five. Now part B asks you to plot the standard deviations for all of the data on figure 20. So you need to take the standard deviation for this one, and you need to then go and plot it so we we need to plot one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. So the standard deviation under, under aerobic conditions is 4. So we need to go from 21 and we need to plot, go down 4 and plot a line. And then we need to go up 4 and draw a line. And then we need to do the same for the anaerobic condition, which is 2. We need to go up 2. our two marks. So calculate the mean percentage change in carbon dioxide production for Servicier when moving from anaerobic to aerobic respiration and then give your answer to four significant figures. So we can see that under anaerobic conditions it's got a uh, carbon dioxide production of bubbles per minute of 13 and under aerobic conditions it's 21 so the difference is 21 minus 13 which is 8 and then we have to divide by the original which is 13 and this gives us an answer of 0 0.61538 and so on, which we then have to multiply by 100 to give us a percentage. And then we have to turn it into four significant figures. So we have to take the 61.8538 and we have to come up with the correct answer, which is 20, sorry, 61.54. Then onto part D. 
So the student drew the following conclusions. All of the yeast I investigated produced more carbon dioxide during aerobic respiration than anaerobic respiration. Now this is incorrect because it's certainly true of these yeast species, but of one yeast species you can see that it produces more carbon dioxide whilst respiring anaerobically than it does respiring aerobically. So the first statement is incorrect because one yeast species produces more carbon dioxide under anaerobic conditions. The second statement, there is a significant difference between the carbon dioxide production in aerobic and anaerobic conditions of albidus. Now, is it significant? There's certainly a difference. We can see the difference here. But if you look at the plot of the standard deviations, we can see that the standard deviations overlap. And because they overlap, we can say that that statement is incorrect because the standard deviations overlap. Therefore, we can't say there's a statistically significant difference between the values for aerobic and anaerobic respiration. So the student found the following definitions of errors in a textbook. So random errors are mistakes during measurement caused by low resolution equipment and systematic errors were repeated inaccurate measurements in the same direction caused by problems with equipment. So which type of error is suggested by the student's data and then justify your answer? Well the type of error that they have here is of a random error because there are large standard deviations in the experiments. Now, anaerobic respiration in yeast cells requires enzymes. Which organelle is responsible for synthesizing these enzymes? Well, enzymes, remember, are proteins, and the organelle responsible for synthesizing proteins is ribosomes. So plant hormones affect the growth of plant tissues in different ways. One such effect is to promote the formation of seedless fruit. So cytokinins are a group of plant hormones. A commercial, and that's quite important, that they're a commercial uh, plant hormone firm carried out research into three different cytokinins. Now, the firm investigated the effect of adding different volumes. They don't tell you how much of each cytokinin they don't say whether they're adding the same volumes of each cytokinin on the production of seedless fruit. They were sprayed on the flowers of different plants. Over time, the mass of the seedless fruits produced by the plants was measured. And they show you a summary of the results. So you can see that as you add kinetin, the mass of seedless fruit harvested goes up. If as you add zeatin, again it goes up and then as you add diatin the mass goes up. Now the question which we're going to look at with the mark scheme in the next slide says on the basis of these results the firm decided to use cytokine used diatin in their new plant spray and they made the following claim on the packaging it's scientifically proven to cause production of seedless fruit when applied to flowers. And then you have to evaluate the firm's conclusion. So this is about making arguments for their conclusion and arguments against their conclusion. And the arguments against the conclusion would be involving criticizing the experiment. So the first thing you can criticize, um, being good biology students, is the fact that they've got the axes the wrong way round. So they've put the mass of the seedless fruit harvested on the bottom axis where it should be here because you need to have your um, independent variable on the bottom and the dependent variable on the up axis. There's also, you don't know what volumes were being applied. 
You don't know how they were applied. You don't know what the control variables are. You don't know how many times it was repeated. You don't know whether there were means. You don't know whether there were standard deviations. So there's a whole morass of different um, things you can criticize. And we'll look at that in the mark scheme on the next slide. So diatin is scientifically proven to cause production of seedless fruit when applied to flowers. And then you have to evaluate the firm's claim. Evaluate using the evidence. Now evaluate means look at arguments for and arguments against, and then look at the validity of the evidence that they have used. So for level three, which is five to six marks, you need to make a statement in support and you need to make a statement against and you need to make more than one comment on the validity of the claim. Alternately, you can make one in support, more than one statement against and a comment on the validity. And then you need to have a well-developed line of reasoning which is clear and written in A-level language. So let's have a look at some of the indicative scientific points that you could have had. So the supporting claims would be, as the volume of the um, diatin, the plant hormone used, as the volume increases, the mass of seedless fruit increases. But against, we can have all of the points that we raised in the previous um, slide, which is there's no scale, that the axes are the wrong way around, that there's no error bars. You should be expressing it as a percentage increase. Correlation does not mean causation. There's a lack of objectivity. Now remember they said this was a commercial um, plant hormone company and the company is selling the product based on those claims. Now the issues with validity are issues with the experimental design and does the experiment actually um, test what it's setting out to test and those that they're trying to get you to think about here is that they haven't told you a method. They haven't told you what species of plant is being used. They haven't told you what variables have been controlled. They haven't told you the concentration. They didn't tell you how they control temperature and carbon dioxide concentration, which should have been the control variables for the growth of the fruit. They didn't tell you where it happened. They didn't tell you the soil type or the availability of minerals. They didn't tell you the availability of water. They didn't tell you light intensity. They didn't say whether there were pollinators or not, because remember, to have a fruit, you need some form of pollination and it doesn't tell you about um, how this would produce seedless fruit. Didn't tell you about weeds, pesticides, herbicides. There was no control group to compare it to. Maybe it would have um, produced seedless fruit if you just sprayed um, water on the plants. There's no evidence of any repeats. Let's move up a bit. And there's no consideration as to how the hormones might interact with other processes. Now, you won't get another question where you have to compare plant hormones on the production of seedless fruit, but you will get questions on evaluating claims, evaluating data. So remember with evaluation, you're looking to make a claim in support and a claim against, sorry, a statement in support of the claim and a statement against the claim and then you need to talk about the validity of the um, data and the validity of the experiment that was used to create that data. So they ask you to identify two limitations of the student's method and for each limitation explain how it limits the validity of the conclusions and suggest an improvement that would improve the validity. So you need to read this method, which is an investigation into phototropism in crest seeds. And you need to think at each point, what are they doing wrong, applying the principles of good experimental design. So it says place 50 crest seeds. Where do you get them from? How do you select them? water with 10 centimeter cubed of still water, 
repeat for three different sets of seeds. Set one in a box, placed in a box to prevent light shining on the seeds so they're in the dark. Set two is placed in a box with light only from above. And set three is placed in a box with light from the right hand side only. Now, they've only done one of each set, so there are no repeats. Keep all three sets at 25 degrees, and then after 72 hours, remove 20 of the seedlings. How do you select those seedlings? It doesn't say. And then count how many have bent. How do you judge whether they're bent or not? How do you judge the degree of bentness? So then you need to identify two limitations of the method, explain how it limits the validity of the conclusions, and then suggest an improvement. So let's have a look at some of the possible suggestions. When you're reading through this and looking at the mark schemes, constantly be thinking about the principles that are important here in good experimental design. So the first one, light intensity. You don't control light intensity. You don't say the size of the hole in the box, why that's important. Different light intensities could lead to variations in the phototropism. Selection of the seedlings, the 20 that were selected, there's no method for selecting them at random, so you could end up with biased results. The improvement would be that you should have some concept of random selection. Degree of bending, well that doesn't get considered, um, so it's not possible to reproduce the experiment because you're not defining what is a bent seedling or not. You could measure the angle of the bend. Finally, the experiment was not repeated so that you can't calculate means and identify the anomalies. You can't carry out a statistical analysis. So the improvement would be to repeat experiment at least twice. You also don't control the size of the dish. So you don't control the spacing of the seeds. They might have different access to light. And how would you improve that? You would specify the size or diameter of the Petri dish into which you put the crest seeds. So figure 21.1 on the insert is a cross section of a part of the cortex of the mammalian kidney. So which letter identifies the region with the highest hydrostatic pressure? So having a look, this is the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. We've got something that here that could be a proximal convoluted tubule or a distal convoluted tubule. And then with D here, we've got a gap between the uh, basement membrane. So this is probably the Bones capsule where we've got the glomerular filtrate being squeezed out and it then goes down the proximal convoluted tubule. And C is a blood vessel supplying blood to the glomerulus. So which letter identifies the region with the highest hydrostatic pressure? So the principle they want you to think about here is that you've got an afferent arteriole and then you've got an efferent arteriole. And there's a difference in diameters between the afferent and the efferent arteriole. And that achieves the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus that forces the, um, fill, forces the blood against the basement membrane. And then that forces the uh, glomerular filtrate through into the Bowman's capsule, where it then passes into the proximal convoluted tubule. So the, the region with the highest hydrostatic pressure is going to be in the glomerulus, so it's going to be region A. Now, which two letters identify regions that do not contain plasma proteins? Now, plasma proteins are in the blood, so that they would be coming through the um, glomerulus, but they would be too large to be pushed across the basement membrane. So they remain in the blood and go out through the efferent arteriole, which then ends up um, in the um, vein um, going out of the kidney. So which two letters identify regions that do not contain the plasma proteins? Well, those plasma proteins are not going to be in 
the uh, bones capsule because they'll have remained in the blood and they're also not going to be in B which is a proximal or distal convoluted tubule so the answers they were looking for here is the plasma proteins would not be in anything where there is filtrate which is B and D Studies of the cell surface membrane of the distal convoluted tubule provided the following evidence. You've got sodium potassium pumps that move potassium ions from the blood into the tubule fluid and move sodium ions from the tubule fluid into the blood. So this is the classic sodium potassium pump. We're going to be using ATP. We're going to be using co-transport. So you're going to be moving one iron one way, one iron the other way. You're going to be moving the potassium ions out, sorry, the sodium ion out, the potassium ions in, and you're going to be driving this with the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP. So this is an active transport process. This happens in the proximal convoluted tubule, and they've told you that there is evidence of a sodium potassium pump in the distal convoluted tubule. Then they tell you about a um, sodium calcium co-transport protein, which moves calcium ions from the tubule fluid and moves sodium ions into the tubule fluid and then uses the electrochemical gradient of the sodium ions to drive this process. So using this information and your own knowledge, compare the processes occurring in the proximal and the distal. So when you're asked to compare, you need to say the similarities are because and then the differences are because. So it needs to be a comparative statement. So both of them use active transport, both of them use co-transport, both of them absorb selectively, and both of them use the use of sodium ions tr to drive that process. Differences, well, differences is that the distal convoluted tubule uses calcium ions. Um, Co-transport in the distal convoluted tubule only uses ions, whereas the proximal convoluted tubule has ions and glucose and amino acids and all of the things that you want to reabsorb from the proximal convoluted tubule that were small enough to pass through the basement membrane into the Bowman's capsule and then go down the proximal convoluted tubule and then you want to reabsorb those things. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is a disease of the kidney that affects regulation of water potential in the blood. One causes lithium poisoning, lithium ions enter the kidney tubules through sodium ions. This prevents the cells of the collecting duct from responding to ADH in the blood. So this prevents the cells of the collecting duct from responding to ADH. So this question is about ADH and collecting duct cells. Now state and explain one symptom that you'd expect to observe. State and explain. So say what the symptom is and why that would happen. Now when you get a question which has a disease that you've never heard of or a situation you've never heard of, this tells you that the question is not about the disease. The question is about the principles of what that disease does. So it says this prevents the cells of the collecting duct from responding to ADH. Well, what does ADH do? ADH is antidiuretic hormone. It's produced by your pituitary gland. It goes round in the bloodstream and then it binds to receptors which are on your collecting duct cells. Now it binds to the receptors. It's a small peptide hormone. It's nine amino acids and it causes a change, uh, a secondary messenger cascade inside the collecting duct cells. And you have vesicles and those vesicles have embedded in them. They have aquaporins. And as a result of the presence of ADH, the vesicles move to the um, collecting duct membrane become part of the collecting duct membrane which increases the number of aquaporins that are in the collecting duct membrane. Now the collecting duct membrane is against the filtrate so the filtrate is passing down the collecting duct. When we increase the number of aquaporins means that there are more protein channels through which water can travel into the collecting duct cell and then into the peritubular fluid and then into the blood. 
Now, if we stop the cells of the, of the collecting duct from responding to ADH, then there will be fewer aquaporins. If you have fewer aquaporins, you will absorb less water from the filtrate as it goes down the collecting duct. Therefore, you will have more water at the end of the collecting duct, which will then pass down the um, ureter into the bladder. So you'll have lots of urination. Lots of urination will lead to um, a raging thirst. And the reasons for this is because you have fewer aquaporins in the collecting duct membrane. So just moving this to the side so we can look at the mark scheme. So high volume or excess production of urine because you're not reabsorbing the water. Therefore, you'd always be thirsty. And then the explanation that's linked to the symptom is that there would be fewer aquaporins in the membrane of the collecting duct cells. So figure 22.2 shows a podocyte from the kidney. The many gaps between the microscopic processes form fenestrations. So these little bits here, these are known as the fenestrations. These are between the secondary processes of the podocyte. And this is where the filtrate is squeezed out. The podocyte is holding the basement membrane in place around the glomerular capillaries. So there will be a glomerular capillary underneath here. Um, and then you'd have a basement membrane and then you'd have the podocyte holding it in place and the gaps between them are the fenestrations through which the uh, filtrate passes through into the Bowman's capsule. Now all that's very interesting but what the question says is explain why podocytes are, are usually unable to undergo mitosis. So they're trying to get you to think about the nature of a highly specialized cell. It's differentiated, it's very specialized, it's in G0. So they're think, getting you to think, well, it's already differentiated, it's very specialized, it's entered the resting phase, so it's unable to undergo mitosis. And then a few other suggestions, well, it's very irregular shape, so it's difficult for it to divide. Um, the cytoskeleton can't function, so it wouldn't be able to form spindle fibers to pull apart the chromosomes. And if it did divide by mitosis, it would affect the number of gaps between the fenestrations, so that would affect the um, movement of the fluid into the Bowman's capsule. Not surprisingly, this question caused a bit of upset with students. Studies show that after damage by infection or injury, it is possible for nephron tissues to be regenerated. Adult stem cells are involved in this process. Now, what features of adult stem cells make them suitable for regeneration of tissues? Now, the crucial word is tissues there. More than one tissue. So what they're looking for here is for you to comment that adult stem cells are multipotent and multipotent means that they can differentiate to become any type of cell within one particular organ. So you have multipotent kidney cells which can form all of the cell types within a kidney which makes them suitable for the regeneration of tissues in plural. Now we finally reached the end of the paper. I hope it's helped with your understanding. Good luck with your exams and thank you for streaming this.